Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Giacalone, South Hills Assembly of God Church, Bethel Park, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in the North Hills area. So glad to have you pastors here with us today. Always enjoy these programs. And today on Hard Questions, we're taking on those tough theological questions. I guess mm. all our questions are theological, right? But this one especially. So are you ready? Let's dive right in. Does God predetermine who will be saved? And to just kick things off, we're going to ask Ray this. <laughs> you know, this show was made for me. I saw all the questions. I thought, well, I'm just going to be talking. Um, Yes, I think that uh, in some way or another, all Christians have to affirm what we're talking about, the doctrine of election or predestination. There's just too many verses that say that. I think the controversy comes in as when we look at, well, on what basis or why or how. But uh, just to give a, a, you know, a few examples, uh, Acts 13, 48. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And, and now listen to the order, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. It's not, and as many as believed were appointed to eternal life, it's as many as had been appointed. And, and we know when that was. We have many passages, for example, in the book of Revelation that talk about their names were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Uh, Ephesians 1.4, just as He chose us, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption, etc. So there's many verses that talk about that, you know, ultimately God has predetermined. If God knows all things and He has the power to change all things and He allows the things to happen, uh, then he has a reason for it. In that sense, he has determined it. And so, you know, a lot of ways you can get at it, but I think um, uh, we have to affirm that. All right. Well, that'll kick us off. Who wants to, who wants well, to jump you know, in I'll there? That, you know, and, and, and I love Ray. We're, we're good buddies. But, <laughs> we all but, love each yeah, other, no matter but, what but, we but, say but, here. I love but, you, man. <laughs> you know, when I look at, you know, uh, the sovereignty of God and God predetermining, I think God predetermined the way that we would be saved. Okay. I think that, when, you know, a lot of times when we read those, ver those verses about, you know, predestination, you know, that's, that, you know, that, that's my take on it according to my uh, theological bent. And, and I would say that God knew who would choose him. Yes. And based on the fact that God knew who would choose him, he, cho he, he elected them. You know, he made sure that salvation was there for them. You know, again, I, you know, I, and, and I, I, Ray, man, he's a, he's a scholar, so, I, you know, I hate to disagree with the scholars. <laughs> don't don't but, yeah, give them a big yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. I'm good with it. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I would look at the fact that, you know, what is God's election based on? And I think it's based on the fact that he knew that we would choose him, you know, when given that opportunity. And those who would choose him, God elected them. He predestined them. He he foreknew them, and those are the ones that he elected. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll give you a chance to respond in a little bit. No, I, that's what I said. I, I mean, he's affirming that God did predetermine its how or on what basis. I said no. that's where we would disagree. Okay. So, yeah. All right. John, uh, Tom, I, I really believe with all of my heart, John 3, 16, for God so loved the entire world that whosoever believeth in him should never perish but have everlasting life. Uh, I, I don't believe that God said, you'll be saved, you'll be damned, you'll be saved, you'll be damned. I believe every human being at one time or another has the opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If that's not correct, then I've got to cut John 3.16 out. And then in, in Ezekiel says, say to them, as I live, says the, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? I just don't believe that, that you know, God says, hey, you're, you're going to the smoking section. Hey, you're coming to the, the Garden the non, of Eden. The non-smoking yeah. section, yeah. All right, good point. Yeah. Yeah, and to their point, um, there's two major views, and I think to Ray's point, you mentioned about how we all believe that there's the elect and that yeah. we've been predestined, but it's how. 
Exactly. I think that's where the break is. So there's mm -hmm. the Augustinian view, which is kind of what you're alluding to, right. which is where uh, God picked you and said, I'm going to give you faith and you, uh, you ain't coming. I'm just not going to call you because I'm God. And so because he's sovereign that he has the right to do that, which I'm not saying he didn't because he's God. He can do anything pretty much that he wants to. But I don't agree with that because it would violate the scripture which is the foreknowledge view, which is what you're talking about that we read about in Romans 8, says whom he foreknew, he predestined, which goes back to what Dr. Glay said. In 2 Peter as well, it talks about how uh, that God desires that none would perish. Right. So for that to be the case, he would not pick somebody and then say, I'm not going to pick you, even though you might have said yes, but because I'm God, uh, that means I'm not going to pick you and give you faith in order to believe. Uh, there's another scripture, Titus 2.11. Uh, that says the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. And then the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 4, which we know based upon foreknowledge, he chose us. So yeah. that lets me know there that because he knew, yeah. he therefore chose. It's not God just hand picking and selecting, like you said, the smoking yeah. and not smoking, so use yeah. your analogy. So I think it's important that, uh, I think that's where we might have the debate more is how did God elect? not the fact that we all believe that uh, he's elected and predestined us. Well, that is that is a really good explanation, Jay. But I want to get back to, to Ray, too, sure. about that. Because, the you know, with this, you know, there seems to be, like you say, uh, many things about election, predestination in the scriptures. But there also seems to be quite a bit about choosing and quite a bit about, you know, those who, you know, come to Christ. What do you do with both of those sides of that? Well, on the one hand... Um, it's, it's in God's um, determination to create, and he has created man, and he has given man and, and called man and, and put him in his image. And, you know, on the one hand, I want to say, well, if you're a believer, you have to, from your will, want and choose Christ. Of course, the believer chooses Christ. But the question is why or even how. You know, we're going to get into this in the next mm -hmm. question as well, but... You know, in my understanding, we only choose what we want, right? Uh, otherwise, it's not a choice. I'm being forced against my will, right. right? Against my yeah. wanting. Yeah. But what is it that the one who's dead in sin wants? He doesn't want to bow the knee to Jesus. Where does that wanting come from? And I would say that comes from God who changes his heart by grace. So, you know, I don't see a, I don't see a contradiction in, well, we have to choose Christ, but God chooses us. I would say, you know, verses like Jesus said, you did not choose me. Well, but I, I chose you. Right. Now, what does he mean? Well, they did choose him. They chose to follow him. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's saying it's because I chose you first. Well, let's go to that second question because yeah, it yeah. kind of <laughs> deals right with this. So here's okay. the second one, kind of in the same little bit other side of the same thing. It says, if we are dead in sin, how are we able to respond to the gospel? Pete, why don't you take us well, off I, 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 I'm, I'm saddened because I don't think the person really looked at the full text. In, in Rome, let me read it. In Romans chapter 6, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? So the, the, the situation here is we are dead. And because we are dead to sin, we are able to respond to the gospel. So I, I don't know how this person is. And, and I'm not making fun, please. I, no, that's okay. I don't know how they're... they're, they're asking this question because because of the fact that I am dead to sin, I can live to the gospel. Or you do not know as many of us who are baptized in Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For death that he died, he died once for all. But life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also, here we go, reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin. Mm -hmm. But here's the, here's the kicker. But alive to God in Christ through our Lord. Okay. So, but, the, but, but before a person is saved. Go ahead, well, Pastor. And I kind of took that a little different. You know, I, I took it if we're dead to sin then what is in us that would make us want to respond to the gospel? There's nothing in us that would want to make us respond. And I th that, that's the kind of the way I kind of looked at it. And, and when you, you look at that, you know, if we are dead, 
then what would want to make us? You know, what in us? There's nothing in us that, that when the gospel was presented before us, mm -hmm. that there's nothing that would say, hey, I want, I want that. And, but, you know, I go back and, and something that Ray said earlier is that, you know, God puts in us, God chooses us. He puts in us what we need to get saved. But then I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump all the way back now and I'm gonna say, why did he put it in us? He put it in us because he knew that we would accept it, that we would, that we would choose us. So, you know, in ourselves, we are dead. We have no power to respond to the gospel. But because God knows that we would choose him, then he puts it in us to respond. Okay, you're making me dizzy over there. Yeah. That, because that's, yeah. that's hard for us to understand, though. Yeah. That is really hard. Jay, you have anything else yeah. on this? Well, yeah. you know, the Bible says in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy, saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So mm -hmm. uh, to your point, once that we, we, can't, we, we can't take away the power of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to remember, that was the one victory that changed everything. Matter of fact, even in natural time, we go back to when Christ was born, we separate the two times BC and AD based upon his birth. And then even in the New Testament, we separate based upon his death, burial, and resurrection, the time of the Old Testament and the New. So everything shifted based around what he did. And that power was so great that now in the Old Testament, we couldn't do it because right. all it would do is cover, but now the, the, through his finished work, he has right. the ability now, if we believe our old man is now crucified right. with him and a new man comes alive based upon what you said, every man has been given a measure of faith. So once that word comes to us because of the work of Jesus Christ, God can sovereignly come down and say, because you put your faith in that, I can now regenerate you yeah. and make you so new. So are we saying then that within the sinner, within the person who's unregenerate, okay, okay? There is nothing that can respond to God unless God puts something right. in there. Yeah, very yeah, clear. Right. To you right. said it earlier, we, no, man can, no, no man can come. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with that. The, the one thing that I would disagree with is, and I think Dr. Glaze articulated it and, and Jay um, affirmed it as well, is what they're talking about is the provenient grace view. Um, that God uh, gives grace to those whom he knows uh, will make use of it. My problem with that is, at the end of the day, in the final analysis, then, then, then God's saying that that person gets it because he deserved it. God saw something that they would do with it. And you and, can't earn it. And, and at that point, that's the, my, my problem is I see that as, well, this person was better. He would be better. If God lowered the bar enough, he would jump over, but this one won't. So he gets in and he doesn't. And I want to go back to, and, and Pete, I, th I think maybe you have you a different I'm question. I'm up against the break here, so ah. I think we need to take the break. Okay. <laughs> We're going to take a break and, and then we'll, we'll come back because there's more with our next question. We'll kind of dive into this as well. So we'll be back in 60 seconds. We're back on hard questions, uh, cut out right in the middle of a really good discussion about if we're dead in sin, how are we able to respond to the gospel at all? And Ray, I, I'm going to go back to you, but let me preface this by saying I've done a lot of evangelism in my life. I've called on people to respond. Absolutely. And, and I don't even know how I can preach the gospel without believing they have some ability to respond. Can well, you, I, I think what my, you know, my understanding would be that God has said that he will save through the gospel. Yes. And therefore, if we go and he calls us to go and to proclaim the, the gospel, you're a sinner, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right. you will be saved. Uh, that, you know, my understanding of that is because there is a doctrine of election and God has his own and he knows who they are, I'm guaranteed success. It's not just that, well, I hope that maybe somebody will believe that if I'm just smart enough, if I say it well enough. No, God's spirit is actually going to go in his timing through the, that gospel, because he has determined to do it that way, so that he will make alive. And, and we call that in Reformed theology, effectual calling. I give an outward call, it's not effectual. Uh, but God can make it effectual, and in fact, he will. Uh, and I would just give my verse, and I, I, I want to just give this and I'll be done. But Ephesians 2, and here's what we're talking about. And you, Paul's talking to Christians, and you, plural, were dead. You were. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked 
according to the course of this world, according to the prince of this power of the air. The spirit who is right now, Paul says, working in the sons of disobedience. That's unbelievers. Among them too, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. Listen to this, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That's where the will is. We were indulging it. We, the will isn't the answer. The human fallen human will is the problem. We're actually running after what we want, which is not God. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Well, where is there any hope? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which, which he, he loved us when you were all those things, made you alive, made us alive, Paul says, together with Christ, by grace you've been saved. That's why it's grace. We were completely dead. We were completely hostile to God, alienated in our minds. Colossians 1 says, God made us alive. And suddenly we were sorry for our sins. And suddenly we wanted Jesus. And yeah. God will do that through us, but it's not us doing it. But, but, the, but to say that, aren't you then saying that God chose some people to go to hell? You know, and, yes, and yes. You know, uh, First Peter says, God is not willing that any should, should perish, perish. Yeah. but that all should come to repentance. That God yeah. so loved the world so if God, if God has this love for the world, for everybody, and he says, I'm picking you, but not you, isn't the fact that he doesn't pick somebody, he's, he's condemning them to go to hell. I mean, I know they're yeah. already, you know, everybody's already on their way to hell. And, yeah. and so, you know, some people would argue, well, the fact that he chose anybody to come off of that road, you know, we ought to praise him for his grace. Yes, yes. But I still can't get out of my mind that he's choosing some people to go to hell. Well, yeah. if, you know, even before we would talk about his choice, you would agree that God foreknows who's going to hell, mm. right? He right. foreknows? Yeah. Without a doubt. And he creates them anyway. So in that sense, he created people that are going to hell, that he knows are going to hell. Um, it's still in some sense then his will because he didn't have to create them. He could have said, you know what, I know those people would go to hell, so I'm not going to make them because I don't want anyone to go to hell. And I, I think at the end of the day, you've got to say that, well, God has a purpose in that. And I would say, you know, there's passages where God is not willing that any should perish. I think that we're talking about God's will of disposition, that God would, that everyone would come to Christ. But by the same token, nobody will. Nobody will unless God puts it in their heart. So God would that we would all make ourselves alive. He offers salvation freely to all. It's a sincere offer. But unless his spirit would go forth and give faith, nobody ever would. That, that's what I believe is deadness to sin is. No okay. one would respond. But, but it would only make sense, though, if we had free will in the garden to get out of the garden. Yeah. It would require free will to get back in. There has to be that there. And to go back, the question is asking, if we're dead in, in sin, sin. Mm -hmm. then how do we choose? And you read it. You said there in Ephesians 2, 5, he made us alive. And I like it in Romans 5, 6 says, for when we were still without strength. So we have to understand it was the death of, to answer the question, to answer the question, it was the death of Christ that gave us the grace and mercy to now make a decision, a choice. And I know we're battling on the fact of can you well, choose or not? We keep coming but, back to that, can we choose? Yeah, yeah. I don't even, I can't even conceive of a salvation where I didn't choose something or that we didn't right, choose right. something. You have to. It, again, like kind of like what you said, we, we, we chose to sin in the garden, our, our original parents did. And we sort of, it seems to me, we have to choose to come back. I don't know, oh, help yeah. me out. I'm thinking of the demonic man who had thousands, even thousands of demons inside of him could not keep him from coming to Christ and coming to the knowledge of salvation. Mm -hmm. So there's something in, I believe God puts in every human being uh, the, uh, the attitude uh, uh, that of his existence. What does it say? A that? measure of faith. A measure of faith in every right. human. Yeah, then it's up course. for them. It's up for them to either incubate that and allow that to grow there, that's the free will there. There's the choice. They can seek it out or they can let that seed die. Yeah. And, and real uh, quickly too, yeah. just in the garden, going back to that, Satan made an offer. Man responded, his nature changed. Yeah. In the gospel of grace, God makes an offer now, the good news, which is why we preach it. Man responds, his nature changes. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. I, I, I can feel Ray over there wanting to respond. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> but uh, anyway, please, if you haven't responded to the gospel, please do so. Oh, that's uh, the key. That's uh, the absolutely, key. that is the key. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And after the break, 
One viewer is going to ask us about baptism and communion. Well, welcome back to the program. We love it when people call in with uh, to our hotline with their questions. And uh, let's go to this one. Yes, was, must one be baptized to take communion? Okay. Must one be baptized in order to take communion? Pastor Glaze. Well, you know, when I uh, look at Jesus, when he you know, gave the ordinance of communion, you know, at the Last Supper, and then you move to 1 Corinthians 11, where it talks about communion. You know, I don't see any prerequisites in there, right. you know, for taking communion. You know, however, you know, I do believe that a person must be saved. You know, that, you know, because right. when you take communion, you know, that represents the body and the blood of Christ. And so what you're saying is that I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I'm taking communion to identify with that. And so, you know, I, the question I would have is, you know, why is a person not baptized? You know, you know why are you not baptized? <clears throat> and, and I think that if it's because of disobedience, you know, which maybe some people, you know, don't want to get baptized for some reason that's unbeknown, then I would say at that point, you probably shouldn't take communion. You know, if you are refusing, <clears throat> excuse me, if you are refusing to be baptized and, and you have a reason you know, that is not a godly reason or not a, a righteous reason, then there's, there's something wrong and you probably shouldn't take communion. But I think ordinarily a person doesn't necessarily have to be. Believers, you need to be a believer to take right. communion. Correct. That's right. what it says. Well, you know, yeah. there's, there's a teaching out there, and I'm sure you guys have heard it, about circumcision of the heart and about a, a certain water baptism. And, and, and it divided many, many churches back in the 50s uh, in Jesus' name only. So I'm, I'm wondering if this person is leaning that way that if you're not circumcised of the heart, <clears throat> if Jesus is not the Lord, can you take communion? If that's the question, yes, Jesus must be Lord of your life to take communion. But you that, see? But, and and I, I agree with that. I don't know what the, the, the viewer is asking here except that he's equating baptism, baptism. in a way yeah. with salvation. That's it seems exactly to right. Me. That's right. Any um, I, I think, and I'm going to differ with the brothers, that yes, you have to be baptized in order to take communion. We know that's the way the early church practiced it. Um, we know that the first thing that happened to somebody who was converted, that we were baptized. You know, and I would look at the upper room where Jesus did the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Everybody in that room was baptized. They were already baptized in John's baptism before they had the Lord's Supper. Uh, baptism, you know, baptism and the Lord's Supper are two sacraments. They're signs and seals of the covenant of grace, signs and seals of the gospel. Baptism is the, is the sign of conversion, of regeneration, of dying to sin, of living in Christ. That's the immediate sign of that you have been regenerate. And then communion is the sign of the ongoing living for Christ, strengthening. That's why you have to eat and drink because this is how you grow physically. And so it's a sign spiritually that you, and you do that until you die. You get baptized once. You're, you do communion over and over again. And so it's a picture of you're converted once and then you live for Jesus. And I would give you a couple of other places. Acts 2.41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Yes. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. All right, and then this, and they, the ones who were baptized, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of the bread, that's communion, and in the prayers. You had to be baptized before you could be invited to the Lord's table. The same thing was true for circumcision in the Passover, which is what baptism and the Lord's Supper fulfill. Exodus 12, 8, when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. Then he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. No one who's not been washed can come and, and eat of the supper. This is why Paul says in but 1 are Corinthians. Are we equating, are you equating baptism with salvation? No, okay. but baptism is the sign of that. The sign and of so in, in, a, in a church yeah. that's ordered by, you know, um, uh, elders who are trying to teach people properly, you have to show the person they have to have that sign of salvation before they can have the ongoing strengthening of salvation sign. Communion doesn't give you that either. It's a sign of it, but it's a, it's a sign of what's ongoing. What had to, you have to have the sign of that it started 
before you have the sign of that it's ongoing. See, I would probably beg to differ a little bit because I believe if you're going to equate Passover with the Lord's Supper, they received the Passover before they ever went through the Red Sea. And the Bible equates the Red Sea with right, the baptism. baptism yes. So I would look at that a little bit differently than my brother here who is more astute than I. <laughs> and uh, I, I would probably look at that because even in the, the scripture only gives us one place in 1 Corinthians 11 that talks about not taking communion the correct right. way in an unworthy right. manner. So right. we're supposed to yeah, judge yeah. ourselves. Right. So I believe that would be more clear. And it makes it very clear that if you do it in an unworthy manner, yeah. then there's something that's going to happen as a result of that. So mm -hmm. that's my take on it. I know we're almost out of time. So, well, And no, that's why I say that, you know, unless there's something in your life that is not pleasing to the Lord, then right. you, you probably shouldn't take it. Right. Yes. right. We have to eat, eat and drink worthily, right. not unworthily. Right. That's right. Great, great scriptures, important things for us to consider. Uh, listen, you sh if you're following the Lord, you need to be baptized. Let, yeah. Just don't even argue about it. Go be baptized and, mm -hmm. and follow God. If you're, if you're following the Lord, you need to ha have that time of communion mm -hmm. and, to, and to celebrate you know, the Lord's Supper with your brothers and sisters. Well, we like to end the program with the scripture. And today we go to 1 John where it says this, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. 1 John 3.1. We hope you enjoyed today's program. Mm -hmm. We want to hear from you. Email us your questions at hardquestions at ctvn.org or call into our hotline, 412-349-4326. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a great day. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.